This is video number four. It is a biopsychology video for A-level psychology students studying AQA A-level 7182. And this video covers ways of investigating the brain. Well, how do we actually find out what's going on in there? How can we study the human brain? Obviously, there is a massive problem with studying the brain because it's locked away inside the cranium, inside um, our heads, and you literally uh, can't see it and can't touch it. Obviously, um, you can wait until someone dies and have a look at their brain that way, but then you're just looking at a piece of meat. And what we would really like to do is to study the brain while it's alive and while it's thinking and doing. Um, so how do we do that? Well, you might remember from video number one the work of Wilder Penfield, and uh, he, what he did is he, he used neurosurgery as an opportunity to study the brain. And when the surgeon had opened up the cranium of the patient and exposed the person's brain inside their head, then what he would do is take a few minutes to give gentle electrical stimulation to parts of the outside of the brain. And he discovered that there was localization of function, that different parts of the brain did different jobs. Now, that was pioneering work from Penfield, but of course it's very limited because you're only ever going to have a few minutes of opportunity during someone's brain operation, and also you have to wait um, for someone to have an operation in the first place. No one is going to volunteer to have a hole cut in their head um, to serve the curiosity of biopsychologists. Of course, um, if we were interested in the brains of animals, then there would be far fewer ethical constraints and a lot of very, very damaging vivisection has been done to animals. But we're not concerned with that. What we're concerned with is human brains and human functioning. And this video is going to cover three methods of brain scanning, and they are EEGs, electroencephalograms, ERPs, event related potentials, FMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging, and a fourth way of studying the brain, which is not a brain scanning technique at all, it's post mortem examinations, simply examining the brains of people who have died. Right, before we start, we need to define two terms, uh, spatial resolution and temporal resolution. Spatial resolution is about the accuracy and precision of measurements in space. And I don't mean planets, the moon, asteroids, stars and galaxies. Not talking about that at all. What I'm talking about is where in the brain things take place. If something takes place in the brain, can we measure exactly where it takes place to the nearest centimetre, or to the nearest millimetre, or perhaps even more precisely. Spatial resolution is the accuracy and precision of measurements about where things are in the brain. Temporal resolution, on the other hand, is exactly the same idea, but it's about when events take place. If a spike of activity takes place in the brain, can we measure when that happens? And with what accuracy and precision can we measure, measure when it happens? To the nearest second? To the nearest millisecond? So temporal resolution is about the accuracy and precision of measurements in time. Okay, so let's consider our first form of brain scanning, which is EEGs, electroencephalograms. You might recall from AS about what an action potential is. An action potential is a pulse of electrochemical activity which passes down the axon of a nerve cell. It's an actual pulse of electricity going along the axon of a nerve cell. And when you get a lot of nerve cells all together, like in the brain, and if those nerve cells are highly active, then you can actually directly measure the electrical disturbances 
caused by the activity of these brain cells. And you can do that very simply by putting electrodes on the outside of the head. And you can get two or three of these electrodes or even hundreds of them. And what the EEG does is very simply directly to measure the electrical activity of the brain through the skull and the scalp and so on. Now, as you can imagine, the spatial resolution of EEGs is very low because you can't tell just by looking at the output of an EEG where something takes place in the brain. However, the temporal resolution of EEG is very high because these electrical waves travel through the, the bone of the scalp really quickly and you can measure the temporal resolution to a high degree of accuracy. It's a bit like looking through a frosted, steamed up window of a bathroom. If you were looking through the frosted, steamed up window and you were trying to work out where something was in that bathroom, you wouldn't really be able to tell with any degree of accuracy. However, if someone turned on the light, then you could tell that really quickly and easily, exactly to the millisecond when the light went on and off. So EEGs have low spatial resolution, but high temporal resolution. The output of an EEG um, typically uh, goes onto a traditional kind of pencil graph with a rolling piece of paper. And the output of that is called brain waves. That's where the word brain waves come from. And we can characterize brain waves by their <coughs> amplitude and their frequency. And those are two terms that we do need to understand. Amplitude is very simply how big the brain waves are. Are they tiny little ones that don't reach up and down very much, or are they massive, strong brain waves with a high amplitude? What's the difference between the peaks and the troughs in those brain waves? Frequency, on the other hand, is about the speed of the brain waves. Are they fast brain waves, which are high frequency, or are they slow brain waves with a low frequency? Okay, the next type of brain scanning technique that we need to know about is ERPs, Event Related Potentials. And ERPs are responses in EEGs. When you hear a noise, or you see something surprising, or you experience any stimulus, there will typically be a spike of electrical activity in your brain, and this will show up in an EEG. The trouble is that in EEGs there's a very great deal of background noise and it, you can't see the ERP against the activity in the background of the EEG. It's very difficult to pick up the signal against the background noise. So what an ERP does is to present the stimulus to the person time and time and time again and to record the EEG over and over and over again and then to superimpose all of these EEGs one on top of the other. And what happens when you do that using the statistical technique is the background noise fades away and the event related potential stands out really, really clearly. It's a way of separating the signal from the noise in brain waves. And an ERP, an event related potential, is able to show you the brain's electrical response to a certain stimulus. There are two types of ERPs that we might want to know about. Uh, ones which take place in the first 100 milliseconds are called sensory ERPs and these reflect an initial sensory response to a stimulus. Ones that take place after 100 milliseconds has gone by, these are called cognitive ERPs, and these reflect information processing taking place on a stimulus. There's a bit of a delayed response. ERPs have the same spatial and temporal resolution as EEGs, because remember, ERPs are derived 
from EEGs. Okay, the next type of brain scanning that we need to know about is FMRI, Functional Magnetic Resonance Imaging. And this is related to and descended from old-fashioned MRI scans. MRI scans, uh, what they do is to detect and map the distribution of fat and water inside a body. They're a bit like a sophisticated x-ray, um, except rather than looking at bone density, what they do is they look at fat and water. Um, you may recall from video number three about how Maguire used MRI scans to look at how uh, the hippocampus of London taxi drivers grows over time. MRI scans tell us a, a snapshot of what the brain looks like on the inside at a particular moment in time. Well, fMRI scans are a little bit more sophisticated than that because what they do is they give us a real-time picture of the actual activity of the brain as it's working. Nerve cells in their resting state have a resting level of action potentials. Usually they'll be firing about 40 or 50 action potentials per second. That's when they're not doing very much. But when nerve cells become excited that rate of firing can increase a very great deal. And so the nerve cell is working harder. It's metabolizing and using more energy. And in order to do that, it needs an increased supply of blood. And what the brain does is if a particular part of the brain needs more energy because it is highly active, the brain diverts blood flow towards that part of the brain that needs the energy. Now, an fMRI scanner can tell the difference between oxygenated blood and deoxygenated blood. And so, if a part of the brain is highly active and it therefore gets an increased flow of oxygenated blood going into that particular region of the brain, then the fMRI scanner can detect that flow of oxygenated blood. So the fMRI scanner, by tracking the flow of oxygenated blood around the brain, can actually tell which parts of the brain are working harder. The brain transfers the oxygenated blood into those particular parts of the brain about one or two seconds after they start working. So the temporal resolution of fMRI scans is about one or two seconds. And their spatial resolution is about one or two millimeters. Um, fMRI scans are very, very expensive. And so they tend to have very, very small samples. Okay, that was fMRI scanners, and in a moment we're going to be looking at post-mortem examinations of the brain, but first it's time for this week's random psychology fact. This week's random psychology fact is that the United States of America is the serial killer capital of the world. Okay, so the final way of investigating the brain that we have to look at is post-mortem examinations. And this is really, really very simple. It's not actually a type of brain scanning at all. What it is, is looking at um, uh, the brains of dead people. Um, you open up the cranium um, of a, a deceased person and um, examine their dead brain. And uh, the idea is that we can look at the abilities and the disabilities that people had in their lifetime and then examine their brains and see if the brains are in any way different from a, a neurotypical brain. But we might remember from video number one how Einstein's brain was subjected to post-mortem examination and it turned out that the part of his right hemisphere which controls his left hand was larger than normal and that is because he played the violin, we think. Uh, we might remember also from video number one Tan, uh, the patient of Broca, and uh, Tan had a brain injury in the frontal lobe of his left hemisphere and he had difficulty speaking. One of the problems with post-mortem examinations is that we've always got an abnormal sample. What we're doing 
is looking at abnormal brains and drawing conclusions about the functioning of normal brains from those abnormal brains. So there might be a problem in generalising from our abnormal sample to the normal wider population. Okay, we have looked at four different ways of studying the brain. We have looked at EEG, electroencephalograms. We've looked at ERPs, event-related potentials. We've looked at fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging. And we've looked at post-mortem examinations. And all of these different means of studying the brain have their advantages and disadvantages. But it's certainly true that the strongest conclusions we have about brain functioning come when we have converging evidence from more than one type of inquiry. So the reason, for example, that we're so sure that Broca's area controls speech is because if a person has damage to Broca's area, they can't speak. But also, if we get a normal person and put them into an fMRI scanner and ask them to speak out loud, then we see electrical activity in Broca's area. You did it. Yep, I think I'll call it a day.